Sally has mentioned, you know, sometimes summer is a time of coming and, and going and perhaps you've been away for a, a little bit or perhaps you're just kind of dropping in or maybe this is your, your first time here and again want to uh, welcome you and so that we're all kind of caught up to speed. We've been working through a series called Life Swap, Life Swap. Um, and it's a series that is looking at the reality that I'm sure for all of us, there are characteristics, there are attributes in our life that, that we would like to remove. Um, maybe it's, 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 it's attributes around issues around pride, or, or, or maybe it's a, a lack of, of self-worth. But there's things in our lives that, that when we start to think about faith, when we start to think about God, that, that one of our prayers would be that, that he would remove them from our lives. And and the reality that we start to look at when we start to read the scriptures is that is true, but, but that's not only what God wants to do in our life. That when there are areas in our life, when there are situations that we find ourselves in, not only does God want to remove them, he wants to replace them. He wants to bring something even greater into our life. And I think sometimes perhaps the struggle becomes for us when we, when we begin to follow Jesus is not just simply focusing upon, well, I wish this would be removed, I wish this would be taken care of, and we fail to see what does God want to bring into our life to replace what it is we want removed. And so when I think of it in, in a few weeks when Jonathan's going to share, and he's going to be speaking about when we want to remove that, that struggle with pride of, of just how it is replaced with humility. Or when we perhaps struggle with this scarcity mindset of do I have enough? Not only does God want to remove that, but he wants to replace it with the reality of generosity. That this is what the transformation situation is within the reality of following Jesus. That he wants to bring transformation into our lives. And it's not simply about what God is going to remove, what God is going to take away, but what God is going to replace with that as well. And so this morning I want to look at, at one particular area in our lives that I, I believe across the board all of us would want removed. That I'm sure there's a situation in our life that it may be more, more prevalent, it may be more raw, it may be more, more recent. But in all of our lives, we've all been hurt. I mean, we live in a broken world. And to get more specific, I'm sure for all of us, we've all find our, found ourselves in situations where, where it's not just a general hurt, but rather we have been hurt by someone and perhaps there's been instances in those moments where we've been hurt by someone where it was completely unexpected, completely undeserved, and completely out of the blue. And the question is how do we deal with our hurt? How do we deal with those people in our lives who have done things to have caused great pain in our lives? How do we remove that and replace it with something greater? You see, I think the challenge we face in life is that on our own, we may try to remove it, but we replace it with something that although we're kind of thinking we're dealing with the hurt, we're actually replacing it with something far worse. Let me just give you two, two examples, two, two typical emotional responses to the hurt that we experience in life. It, it's often referred to as the fight or flight response. And maybe in your own mind you can relate to this, but, but when someone has hurt you, and you know, the reality of this is that this is not just thinking just in general terms, but perhaps you can think of a moment of a situation where someone has hurt you and your immediate response, your emotional response is I'm going to fight this. More specifically, I'm not going to fight this. I am going to fight you. And there's this welling up, this sense of anger that, that begins to grow and, and you want to deal with your hurt by striking back. It's that, it's that old adage that you often hear in movies and, you know, we think it's kind of cool when we hear it in an action movie, but in reality it just doesn't work. It says, I, I don't get mad. I don't get mad. I get, right? And we, we, we know that and we can say that, but 
How helpful is that? As you start to go down the line and you think of someone who has hurt you, we're completely unnecessary, completely unexpected, and then you respond in lashing out with, with anger. I know in my own life that when I have that emotional response, in the moment, in a moment, it feels pretty good. It feels real good. But then you start to see the carnage that is left as a result. And I think if you're being really honest, that, that, that not only does it not work, but it actually causes even greater problems within. The flip to this is that we may think, well, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to lash out. I'm not going to get even. I'm going to flee the situation. I'm just going to remove myself from the person, from the thing, and I'm just going to pretend pretend it never happened. And again, in the moment, it, it might work. But over time, does it? Because what I begin to see over and over is that when we choose the path, when we choose the emotional response of saying, when someone has hurt me, I am just going to step away. I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen. I'm just going to not deal with it. I'm going to kind of like, like sweep it under the carpet we fall into the trap of thinking that time heals all wounds. But does it? Does does simply stepping away from a certain situation or a circumstance, does simply allowing time to grow, does it actually bring healing? I I don't think it does. It causes the the hurt to go a little deeper. It causes a sense of bitterness and, and resentment to start to well up. And so what is our response? What is a helpful response? What is, what is a difficult response for us to, to step into these places where, where we have been hurt? And to not respond, not to allow that hurt to be replaced with anger or denial. But to step into something far greater that brings transformation. This morning I want to look at a passage in the Bible In the New Testament, if you have a Bible, you want to turn there. We're going to go to the book of Colossians. It's near the end of the Bible. We're going to put it up on the screens, and we're going to read in a moment as well. But just to give you some some perspective on this, is that this is written in the first century by one of the great followers of Jesus, a person by the name of Paul. And, And Paul was someone who would have understood hurt. Not only in the causing of hurt, but also the experiencing of hurt as well. Because before Paul was was transformed by Jesus, he was someone who maliciously went out attacking and putting in prison and watching other followers of Jesus be put to death. So he doled out his fair share of hurt. But he was also someone that once he became a follower of Jesus, he experienced tremendous persecution and hurt as well. There's one passage where he's writing to another group of Christians in the city of Corinth where he just basically gives a laundry list of the things that that, that he has experienced, the things that that he has suffered, of of how he has been beaten. He has had his clothes stripped from him. He has been been shipwrecked. He has been put in prison. And so many of the times, this was nothing that he had done or deserved. People deliberately hurt him. And so he's addressing a group of Christians in the city of Colossae, people he'd never met before. But here was the situation. They had recently become followers of Jesus, and they were asking the question, so what does this look like? Like, what, what difference does this make in my life? That, that, that yes, we believe in Jesus. Yes, we believe he's, he is the Son of God. Yes, we believe that he died for me. Yes, I believe that, that he rose from the grave. But it's the question that sometimes we may ask, so what? What difference is this going to make? And so Paul writes this this, this amazing letter. It's actually broken into four chapters to help us follow along a little bit better. So if you wanted to later this afternoon, you know, under an umbrella, by a pool, later this week, you want to read it through, you can probably get through it in about 30 minutes, right? But it's set up beautifully because it essentially constructs for us the reality of the gospel of Jesus. Because the first half of the book of Colossians is all about everything that Jesus has done for us. 
And this is the, this is the fact of Christianity, that Christianity is front-loaded with the grace of God. That in so many other beliefs, and so many other faiths, it's always, you do this, and then you will be approved. Christianity blows that out of the water because it says, listen, listen, don't worry yet. Don't worry about what you need to do. Look at what Jesus, look at what God has done for you. And then in response, this is how you are to live. And so that's basically the summary of the book of Colossians. And we're going to land in one place, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12. We're just going to tackle three verses. And we're going to look at a specific way in which we can, I believe, appropriately respond to the hurt in our life. The way that not only brings about healing, but brings restoration and brings a sense of transformation into our life. So I want to invite Vivian to come and read that, and then we're going to, we're going to unpack this together. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. The word of the Lord. A thing you have to appreciate about Paul or get really annoyed about with Paul is he packs a lot into a couple verses right? Like a lot of characteristics, and you're like, holy smokes, like, can we just focus on one? And so I would suggest this, that when it comes to dealing with hurt, when it comes to the reality of how do we respond positively, how do we, how do we replace our hurt with something that is transformational, I would say it's in one word. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is, is one of those great words that, that, that we like to talk about, we, we, we like to tell others about, until we have somebody to forgive. And so I, I'm, I'm hoping, I hoping for us this morning that, that as we talk about this, as we work through this, that, that we're not thinking about someone else in our life. Thinking, oh wow, they should be here this morning. I'm going to share the link with them because they got some forgiveness they need in their life. As opposed to saying, what, God, what are you wanting to say in my life? Where is a hurt in my life that I need to step into forgiveness. Now understand, this is not something that is easy. This is not something that, that just happens in a moment. It doesn't often even happen just with even a, a simple prayer. And so what I want to do is get just hyper-practical this morning. Because I, I think I've let you down if at the end of this service we sing a few more songs and you walk out of here and you think, okay, yes, I need to forgive, I need to forgive. And you're like, what does that look like? What does that look like? And so I want to look at this passage. I want to walk through this passage because I think there is some just helpful, helpful realities that, that begin to put a little bit more meat on the bones in terms of what it looks like for us to forgive. So that when we are hurt, when we experience hurt, we can start to understand this, this process of what it means. The first thing I want to do is just talk about two things that forgiveness is not. Because sometimes we may misunderstand what forgiveness is and what we're being asked to do. Forgiveness is not forgetting. I don't know if you ever heard that, 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 that phrase of forgive and forget, right? Just, just forgive and forget. Just, just, just move on. And it's like we're almost making a prayer that we're asking God for spiritual amnesia, right? And, and this, is, this is unhelpful because I don't think it works because, A, we don't forget. And then what ends up happening is as we're going through the process of wanting to forgive, as soon as the, the memory of the person or the memory of the situation comes back up, we think, oh, great, oh, crap, I haven't, I haven't forgiven. Right? And so forgiveness is not forgetting. I believe, and we'll get to this in a moment, but you know you're going down the journey of forgiveness is when you can remember the person, when you can remember the situation, and there's less of a sting. That maybe it's not that same emotional response that you would have given. 
So Paul is not saying forgiving is forgetting. The other thing that Paul is not saying is forgiving is excusing. It's it's interesting, and and I, I do this with my kids. I do this in my own life, and it's actually something I think we need to remove. If you've ever been in a situation where you, and sometimes it's often on, on minor offenses, so it's probably not that big of a deal if you catch yourself doing this, but you, you do something and you, you, you wrong someone or so, someone has wronged you and you go to them and you say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm really sorry, right? You say, I'm really sorry. And then what, the, 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 the natural response is like, oh, don't, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Do you ever fall in that category sometimes where you say, you know, I don't, don't, don't worry about it, or it's okay, it's okay. No, 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 no. It's not okay. It's not okay, whether it's big, whether it's small. And that's the important thing for us to understand is that oftentimes we may fall in the trap of thinking, well, forgiveness is, is I'm, I, don't, I don't want to condone the behavior, and that's not. That's not what forgiveness is. And and so maybe that's a helpful thing to understand, that forgiveness is not forgetting, nor is forgiveness excusing. And so what is forgiveness? I want us to walk us through four things that that I believe come out of this passage and has been helpful for me to help me understand how how do I get into a place of forgiving so that I experience the reality of God in my life and that I can have restoration in a relationship that can too easily go off the rails. The first one is this, and it's found in verse 12. The first thing that forgiveness is, is it is intentional. It's intentional. And what I mean by that is it's not an emotional response. Let me put it out. It doesn't come naturally. Or maybe it does to you, but it doesn't come naturally to me. I don't, I don't wake up or if someone hurts me, the first thought is not, oh, I am so glad you did that. I'm just so ready to forgive you. No, 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 no. It's like I am going to get angry at you or I'm going to, I'm going to step away from you. See, those are the natural response. Right? That's the emotional response is often the fight or the flight. Forgiveness is not a natural response. It's not our first response. And so I think one of the things that's helpful is for us not to beat ourselves up over it thinking, well, I don't, I don't really feel like forgiving. Well, welcome to the club, right? If we wait to feel like forgiving, we will never get there. Let your emotions catch up to your actions. And so why do I say that? In verse 12, Paul says this. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Clothe yourselves. One of the, one of the cool things about Paul is he always gives you images, right? Right? How many of you, real, real, just going to see who's tracking with me here, who's not dozing off and thinking about Swiss Chalet yet. How many of you are wearing clothes this morning? Okay, really, I'm not working with much here, all right. Whew. Okay, okay, how, how many of you had to put some thought into putting clothes on this morning? Yeah, some of you looking at your spouse and are like, you should put a more thought into what he was wearing, right? Right? It, does, it just doesn't happen. You don't just suddenly wake up in the morning and jump out of bed and be like, ta-da, hey, what do you know? I'm wearing my clothes, right? That, that doesn't happen. Unless when you're sometimes a, a teenager and you go to bed in the clothes you're wearing the night before and you show up. But, but at some point, you put these clothes on, right? It was intentional. And that's what Paul was saying. But, but he says something else. It's not enough just simply to put on clothes It's also to understand what clothes are appropriate to wear, right? So I'm not going to get into dress code here this morning, but but if you would have shown up in like a parka and a toque and snow pants, I I would have been like, what's wrong with, yes, you're wearing clothes, but you're wearing the wrong kinds of clothes, Right? In the same way, if you bust out the swimsuit and the, and the towel in February, yeah, no, no, especially living in Canada, right? Other places that might be cool, right? But in February, so you got to dress appropriately. And this is what Paul is saying. If you want to step into forgiveness, understand you must clothe yourself with something. 
And you must be intentional about it. And so what is he asking us to clothe ourselves with? Notice the five things he says even before he gets to the word forgiveness. We think, we're just gonna, I'm just going to jump right into forgiveness. This is going to be a piece of cake, right? No. Paul says, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That if we want to begin to step into this reality of forgiving, we, we need to have compassion. We, 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 we need to be gentle. We, we need to be refusing to respond to the person the way that they have responded to us. We need to be humble enough to realize that even though what they did was not right, we are going to step into the process of forgiving. And Paul also says we need to be patient. We're going to get to that in a moment. So that's the first thing. We need to be intentional. So the question I ask myself is, if I want to be forgiving others, what am I clothing myself with? Am I, am I stepping more into compassion? Am I becoming more gentle? Am I being humble in my life? So that I can prepare myself to forgive. The second thing I realize about forgiveness is that it is incredibly costly. It's not cheap. It's what Paul says in verse 13. He says, bear with each other. Bear with each other. And forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. It, it comes at a cost. I don't know if this is my morning of just like, jumping on cliches that I don't think are, are helpful. But there's another one that you oftentimes come across, and it's this one. It says, it says, love means never having to say you're sorry. Have you ever heard that one? Love means you're never having to say you're sorry. You know anything about that? <laughs> right? That's ridiculous. No, it, it, love, is a, love is a commitment. Love bears a cost. And the hard thing about forgiveness is the person who is going to forgive is the person who's going to bear the cost. Because it says that you are giving up your right to get even. So you bear the cost. Third thing is that it takes time. Forgiveness is a process. And this goes back to that list that, that, that Paul talked about, is that if you want to forgive, you need to clothe yourself with patience. Because it's going to take time. It's not like, you know, like, I, if I could have one wish or I could do one thing. It understands that it takes time. There's a great, a great conversation uh, between Peter and Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. So, so Matthew is, is, is recording this. And and Jesus has been teaching, and, and Peter comes up to Matthew, no, Peter comes up to Jesus one day and says, listen, listen, um, can you just help us? How, how many times should we forgive someone else? Like, Jesus, just give us a number. I don't know about you, but I'm with Peter on this one. Like, just give us a number. Just, just tell me what the number is, and then when I reach that number, you're done. You're done. Right? And what's interesting is Peter then even, because this is Peter, he always offers a suggestion to Jesus. He's like, like what, what about seven? Is, is seven a good number? And in the context, that was a pretty darn good number. Because the rabbis in Jesus' day, so the other religious teachers, were saying, listen, you can forgive someone up to three times. Right? They, they were talking about baseball even before baseball existed. Like, three strikes and then you're done. You're, you're done. I'm done with you. And so Peter's like, okay, Jesus, Jesus teaches in a different way. Jesus is different than all these other rabbis. So I'm just going to double it. I'm going to add one. And so what do you think, Jesus, seven times? Is seven times a good number? And Jesus is like, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times. Other translations have it as 70 times seven. And so for all you math whizzes out there, don't tell me what 70 times seven is. The point that Jesus is making is that forgiveness is ongoing. There's never a number that you can then suddenly say, you know what, I've, I have tried. I, I am done. I am moving on. Jesus says you continue with it. You continue at it. And I think this is why 
patience is so important. And as I think about that scenario that, that Jesus was talking about with Peter, you know, we, we, we can interpret it one of two ways. We can interpret it as, what if the same person offends you 77 times or over and over and over again? I think there's application there. But I think the application that is often missed is often wonder if Jesus was talking about how even that one offense, you seem to have to forgive over and over and over again. That it becomes a process of saying that even though I've stepped into forgiveness, that, that when I remember the situation or when I remember the hurt again, I forgive it again. I, I, I hand it back over to God again. So I think forgiveness is intentional. Forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness takes time. And then the fourth one is this. Forgiveness can't be done on our own. I think this is where we begin to see the heart of the gospel. We see it in the final verses of what Paul was talking about. He says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's, it's the reality of where our focus becomes. That if we're wanting to step into forgiveness, we, we focus again upon Jesus. Upon how we have been forgiven in order that we can forgive. Remember I said earlier that, that Christianity is, is a response to what God has done for us. And oftentimes, the struggle with us forgiving others is because we fail to see how greatly God has forgiven us. Norm, in his prayer, uh, had the Lord's Prayer, and that may be familiar, maybe not, but I think the most mumbled line in the Lord's Prayer is the part where it says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You know that line? I think it's a mumbled line because sometimes... Um, We we don't know what word to put in there, right? Trespass, sin, debt, right? We we sometimes get it wrong. I was actually, as a student, preaching at a church through the summer, um, and and they they did the Lord's Prayer. And so I was was a small congregation, maybe 30 people there, and it came to the Lord's Prayer, and I just was, I was a a trespasser kind of guy, right? I I was going to say trespasses. And so I'm leading it, you know, with this confidence, youth, and and everything else. And we get to the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our trespasses. Well, they were debt people. They were debtors. Through the whole prayer, no one knew how to finish the prayer. Everyone was just kind of mumbling along. Well, the next week, up on the pulpit, that's when I still preach from a pulpit, in like 24 font print was the Lord's Prayer underlined, highlighted debts, debts. So I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get it wrong. And so, but I think oftentimes why this is such a mumbled verse is because we realize what is at stake. Is that forgiveness is not an option. Jesus isn't asking us, you know what, forgive, forgive if you feel like it. Forgive if you want to go to the next level. No, 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 no. Jesus is making the implication that, that as we have been forgiven, we too will forgive. Our example comes from Jesus. It comes from the reality of all that he has done for us. So what's our next steps? I want to suggest two things for all of us here this morning. That in, that in knowing all of these things, this, this, th- this can be helpful, but it still hasn't gotten us into the place of application. That if, there's, if you're in a place here this morning where, where, where you're needing to forgive, these are the two things that I do. The first one is to place my focus upon Jesus. That's where I begin that I have to take my eyes off of the offense or off of the person and focus first back on God. To recognize and to realize how I have been forgiven and it's only through the power and the strength of God that I will be able to forgive. So put your focus first upon him. And then the second thing 
is bring the unedited response of the hurt you've experienced to Jesus. You see, if we want to forgive, I believe it has to go through Jesus. That when we try to do it on our own, we'll oftentimes perhaps respond in inappropriate ways. But when we focus upon Jesus and when we bring our response through Jesus, we land in a place where we are able to forgive. I think this is the power of the gospel. This is the reality of God at work in us when we are able to do that which we can't do on our own. And the perfect example is if you're thinking of a situation right now and think, I could never forgive that, or I could never forgive them. It's because we need the work of God in our lives. But it doesn't mean we are going to not ever remember. It doesn't mean we are going to excuse it. But it does mean we don't want bitterness or anger or resentment to fill our life. Because Jesus has something far better. I'm going to invite the musicians to come up. We're going to sing a couple songs to conclude. But before we do, I just want to lead us in a, in a short prayer. And I'm just going to lead us through these two steps. And so maybe if there's someone or there's something that you're experiencing here this day, that, that this can become a part of your prayer. But let us just pray and let's just allow God to be at work in our lives. Let's pray together. And so Lord Jesus, as we come before you this day, as we sang that song earlier, mindful of just, of just who we are in you. That we are your chosen ones. We are loved by you. Jesus, let us fix our eyes upon you. Let us remind ourselves again of how we are loved, how we are forgiven. How you've poured your grace upon us. But I also pray for those of us here this morning that maybe have a specific person or, or, or a specific instance that, that could be recent, it could be a long time ago. But Jesus, we want to bring this to you. And we pray that you would work in our lives, in our situations, so that we can experience forgiveness in the midst of all things. We ask all these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.